Hey Magic Community on YouTube, T1 Glistenrof here. I am still in quarantine. We're still in lockdown here. We're still in our shelter in place where I live here in Georgia. And so I figured now's as good a time as any to do an AMA. And while you're listening, there's a video of Evangeline and me just playing around, as we do. So I asked patrons and the people that my patrons asked uh, to shoot me some questions, whatever they'd like to know. What burning questions do they desire to have answered? And I got, of course, the most serious of questions right off the bat from my good friend James over at Tapstar. He asked, Pirates or ninjas? Now, I think that it's pretty clear to anyone who plays Popper that ninjas are absolutely the better type, but if you play other formats now, you also know that ninjas are the better type. <laughs> I do like the flavor that they've had with pirates, but, oh, okay, no, this is just actual ninjas versus actual pirates. Um, if you look at the URL for my channel, not the C slash T1 Glistener Elf, the original one, I did <laughs> a bit of rebranding. Uh, the URL is locked in as ninjaism, and the first five letters of that are ninja. Okay, so I had a nickname in high school, uh, ninja, uh, for a few reasons, but I think the the original one was being the guy who got up on the roof of the school to get down a, a hacky sack, a soccer hacky sack, and ever since then I was ninja. Did other stuff too, but that that's kind of the the legend, I guess. Maybe maybe got in trouble for a few shenanigans like that back when I was in school. <laughs> maybe. All right, but then the next one comes from uh, Rukulin T1 Reese the Redeemed, uh, which is thoughts on companions, especially Luris and oh man, <laughs> the companion mechanic. I don't inherently dislike. The concept behind it, I think, is fine. You are imposing two restrictions, effect, or two opportunity cost here. One, you use up a sideboard card, it, and it depends on formats. If it's EDH, no, but I'm usually going to be talking, unless I say otherwise, about traditional magic, I guess? Traditional constructed magic, uh, where you're using up a sideboard slot, which really isn't that big of a deal. You get an extra card in your hand, if you will, for one sideboard slot, it's it's not really... It's a no-brainer, <laughs> to paraphrase Sam Black. Why would you not? Uh, so that's, that's number one. But number two, it's also supposed to be balanced by the restrictions that you have to put in on your deck if you'd like for them to be your companion. If they're just in the deck, whatever. But if you'd like them to be your companion, you have to meet those requirements. And that is really tough to do. Make them too onerous, and it's kind of unplayable make them too lenient, and, well, you get cards like Luris. Now, <laughs> Luris is, I don't think this is really controversial, the most playable of the companions, in a general sense. Maybe per format, you could argue differently. Standard or Pioneer, maybe it's Yorian. But in general, it's absolutely Luris. And Luris is supposed to have an extra little balancing factor. Remember, Luris only lets you run non-land permanents uh, CMC 2 or less, and Luris is 3. So the idea is that you only get one Luris if Luris is your commander. You don't get any in your main board. That is absolutely not a real restriction. Luris is way too good. It's also, you only get to cast that spell once per each of your turns. That is still not nearly enough to balance the card. It's just way too good. So, there, there are my thoughts on companions. <laughs> I like to think of companions, the, the easiest comparison for me is something like, so I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh, I still do play Yu-Gi-Oh, but not competitively, and in Yu-Gi-Oh you have cards in your extra deck. Think of it as an extension of your hand, and I don't mean like how the graveyard is for some decks, an extension of their hand, I mean basically it is. If you meet usually some pretty lenient requirements, then you get extra cards out of your deck that can, or extra deck, I should say, that get extra cards out, that get extra cards out, and then you get to go crazy. Lots of the forbidden list, or limited list, is made up of cards that did way too well out of the extra deck because they're just an extension of your hand and they were too easy to get and or did too much. I think that companions are doing some, somewhat the same thing. The concept itself is fine as long as it's balanced well, 
but it's very tough to balance this well. Mm, that's th Those are my thoughts on it. And I know that immediately, as soon as I said Yu-Gi-Oh, some people tune me out. I apologize. Actually, as, as soon as they see it's not immediately a magic video, I suppose, some people probably tuned away. So I, I apologize for that. Uh, but then I got some extra questions in, because uh, Chris Long is one of our one of our patrons, and he asked around. So <laughs> we have a few questions going around here. So I'll get to Chris's first. Uh, he asked me a couple. One, uh, top three cards in Ikoria. Well, I gave you two of them already. Um, I may have to actually give four, because I'm really divided on what would be third place, and what would just be an honorable mention. I should say... I'm answering this for formats in general. This, this may not make a lot of sense for some formats, but you'll, you'll see what I mean in a bit. So number one is Luris, obviously. In every format outside of maybe Standard, but even then, <laughs> Luris is just insane. Luris is way too good, and absolutely, I, I am going to be running Luris Infect. That is how good that card is. I will gladly give up one sideboard slot and make Phyrexian Crusader into Plague Stinger, and that's basically all, no, that's all I have to do to take Golgari Infect and add Luris instead. And it's not even really using up a sideboard slot because what would have been, say, like a Kitchen Finks or a Pulse of Marasa just becomes a lifelink creature. That's still pretty good. <laughs> it fits into those same matchups. So, Luris number one. Luris is also insanely older the format gets. We've, we've all seen Ad Nauseam Tendrils with Luris at this point. At worst, Luris is extra storm count. Lion's Eye Diamond, you discard your hand, but oh look, Luris isn't in your hand, so cast Luris, then get Lion's Eye Diamond back. At the very worst, that's what we're looking at. Although, that's not actually what you do. You would have, uh, you would have the... D Infernal Tutor in hand first, so you could get some, Yeah, you, you get the idea. Okay, cool! <laughs> Number two is Yorian, which is more playable than I initially gave it credit for. 20 cards is not that big of a deal. You can run the numbers on it. it, it makes a difference, but the fact that you always have a card in hand, I would say makes up for... having an extra card in hand makes up for that. It is a 4-5 flyer for 5 mana. In and of itself, that's not enough. But you can absolutely build a deck around that, and even if you didn't, you still have, like, a 4-5 flyer for 5 mana. That's a win con. That's something. If you're playing a control deck, the fact that you always have your win con that you can lean on whenever you need to, that's pretty good, actually. It gives you the freedom, if you need, to run fewer win conditions in the deck because you have one out from the sideboard. Now, don't. You still need to have some in the deck, because if that gets countered, or killed, or whatever, then you're in trouble. But, I I did not consider how strong Yorian actually is, especially as formats get older. It, it's easy enough to see that being the case in Standard, even Pioneer. Seeing Yorian in Modern is still kind of baffling to me, but I guess I get it. I guess. Run Luris instead, though, please. <laughs> All right, so, and then number three, um, so this gets tricky because I, I have two and I can't really just pick one. I think that the, the right answer is probably Fiend Artisan. I, I have another, give me a sec. Fiend Artisan is two mana and it's hybrid mana, so it's flexible. You can play it in Deathrite Shaman colors, which is to say you can play it in anything. And it's a 1-1, one, one, but it's actually something like an 8-8, eight, eight, <laughs> realistically. Um, now, it's not immediately going to go into something like Dredge. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't come out of the grave. I don't mean it like that. But, it's a 1-1 one, one that gets plus 1, plus 1 for each creature card in your graveyard. So it gets a life. You're putting it in a deck, you're building the deck around that in all likelihood. And it has this Fauna Shaman effect. You're going to sack a creature to search your library for another creature, but it's not just any. You're not birthing, but this isn't birthing pod. You're not going and getting one that's a CMC higher. There's not a restriction like that. No, it's CMC X, and you can pay X when you tap it. So you get flexibility as long as you have the mana. You get flexibility over whatever you get. And it goes into a company deck because it's only two CMC, and you can run it with Court of Calling, 
it's green so it can even pay for Court of Calling. <laughs> And that means that you're going to be able to throw it into combo decks. I, I remember Maliripod. I remember Devoted Company. This card can be obnoxious. <laughs> and it's recur You can do it multiple times. Yeah, this, is, this looks to me like it could be a problem, especially as you get into older formats, but maybe not necessarily too much older. I have a hard time seeing it being broken in Legacy. Uh, it's still good, and a deck like Nickfit could use it, it just seems a bit slow. It's not an artifact, it's a creature. You won't get to use it on that turn, and you have access to things like Green Sun Zenith in Legacy, uh, and much faster decks, and Force of Will. So, I don't know that it quite makes it there, but in Modern, this absolutely has potential to be broken, in my estimation. It can either be a combo enabler, finding pieces that you need for that combo, or it's a good little backup win con because this is a two mana huge creature. It can compete with Tarmogoyf. Absolutely. It can exceed Tarmogoyf. It's not even that hard if you're building a deck around it. <laughs> yeah, when you're pushing Tarmogoyf out, there's a problem. Okay, but this loses harder to Graveyard Hate. But even then, you can still use it to tutor stuff. Anyway. Anyway. The other one is, I think, a little sketchier. I, I don't... This may just be my bias as a brewer. I would love for this to be the case, but I think I can make a reasonable case in newer formats. Karuga the Macro Sage. This is one of, in my estimation, the more underrated of the companions. Your starting deck has to contain only lands and cards with CMC 3 or greater. Now, in Autarky, that sounds kind of bad. You're not going to be able to do anything for the first couple turns, right? No! No! <laughs> We're magic players! We find loopholes all over the place! As long as the card's actual CMC is 3 or higher, if you can cast it for less than that, then you're set. Now, the easiest way to break this in standard is, of course, adventures. There are at, at least a few really playable ones. Uh, Bone Crusher Giant is CMC 3 or greater, but Stomp is 2. Uh, Brazen Borrower is 3 CMC, but Petty Theft is 2. That makes it, that seems good. That gives you something that you can do, both of those are, are two mana for the adventures, but that gives you something that you can do a turn ahead, and you can still, now, you can still use the, oh, okay, wait, 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 wait. In standard, there is another thing that can break Kruga. I'm gonna break. <laughs> it's pretty easy to see, it's Fires of Invention. Fires is already an established deck, and it's already inclined to play higher CMC spells because they don't cost anything for them. Once they already have Fires of Invention out, they get to take advantage of the extra value. Effectively, they're getting maybe up, up to twice the mana that they would normally be able to create. But being able to have adventures means that they can use the adventure and the card it's based on, the, the creature version of it, with both uses of Fires of Invention, uh, and you'll still be able to meet the requirements for Karuga and Fires of Invention can be used to cast Karuga, and you cast Karuga, draw a bunch of cards, at the very least you're drawing two because Fires qualifies, and then you still have a spell that you can use for Fires. I will say that as the format gets older, you get access to more cards that allow you to work around this. In Modern, you get Dismember. In Legacy, you get Force of Will. In both, you get Force of Negation, and so on. You get plenty of cards that work around this in their own ways. You get Delve spells. You can still play Adventures if you feel like it. Uh, and, and so on. You get Fuse cards! Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems like it can make sense. It seems like Kruga has much more of a home because there are so many spells, especially in older formats, that lets you work around this. Now, is being able to draw a card for each permanent in play that's CMC 3 or greater going to be worth it on a 5 mana card? And the answer is yes! Okay, actually it depends. It depends. I, I think you can get away with that if you're playing Legacy or if you're, yeah, if you have access to Force of Will. Uh, because you can protect it and then make up for the card disadvantage of Force of Will by just drawing a bunch of cards afterwards. You also get a Basalt Monolith, which is three and makes three mana 
it pays for itself. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know why I got hung up on that card. I, I would like to be able to see someone make a combo deck in Legacy that goes off with Spirit Guides, Simeon Spirit Guide. Oh yeah, you have Simeon Spirit Guide in Modern. That's right, you have that too. <laughs> Elvish Spirit Guide, um, uh, Monoliths, shenanigans like that. I, uh, uh, Chancellor of the Tangle, there, all kinds of crazy things. I'm getting excited just talking about this. Little secret, it's probably not actually that good, but I really want it to be good really want to. You may or may not see me brewing with this card in the coming months. You absolutely will. But the actual answer is, yeah, probably Feigned Artisan. <laughs> a little less exciting. Uh, but then we get to, we have uh, another question from Chris, and that is, how will, it which may not be named, <laughs> the, the, the pant, the virus, the thing that's going around that will get this video demonetized if I talk about it. <laughs> How will that uh, affect player behavior moving forward? I wouldn't think all that much, but every now and then you see a discussion come up on Magic Twitter about how you should offer a handshake, should you shake hands with your opponent, so on and so forth. And the answer for a while is going to be a pretty hard no, I would imagine. <laughs> Even once we get back to playing in person, it's going to, at the very least, feel awkward to do. Actually extending your hand out to someone after we've been physically distancing or socially distancing for so long is going to be something of a hard thing to do. And that's going to be hard for me because I'm really friendly and I like to shake hands and do high fives and stuff like that. I'm going to have to be doing thumbs up for, for a good while instead or OKs, or Air Fives, or whatever, you know, something else. Something else. All right. So then we have some questions from TJ Poole. Shoutouts to TJ Poole. Uh, Chris asked, and uh, wow, you had a few, dude. You had a few. <laughs> OK, so three questions. Number one, who do you think are the best, mostly unknown magic players, and why? And this is, this is hard to answer because it depends on where that threshold is, where that line is. I, the way that I draw the line, I count Jonathan Zaksek, aka Nikachu MTG, as still relatively unknown, at least in a competitive sense. He's absolutely a great player. He makes 5 O's with some, with some consistency. He's been in the finals of a GP, but he's still not a regular enough player that we get to see all that. Um, and, I mean... He's, he's really cool, good friend, shout-outs to you, <laughs> shout-outs to you, Dikachu, shout-outs to you, Dikachu, there we go, Poet didn't know, all right, um, but, but, he is kind of known, he has a YouTube channel with several thousand subscribers, uh, he, his big, sh his thing is that he sticks with just one archetype, well, kind of, he, as long as it's playable in a given format, he will play Merfolk, it doesn't matter if it's modern, or Legacy, or Vintage, <laughs> or even Pioneer for a while, uh, or Historic, or back when it was in Standard, in Standard, etc. Just as long as it's possible, he's going to force Mort Merfolk in everything, and because he plays the same deck over and over and over and over, he knows the ins and outs of that thing. If you want to talk to anyone about Merfolk, he's kind of the go-to guy because he has years of experience, and technically experience isn't necessary for being a good magic player. You could be good just on theory alone, but his experience means that he's made those mistakes over and over again to the point where now he doesn't make them anymore. He's seen those situations often enough that he doesn't have to think about them especially hard. They're not novel to him. It's like when I play Infect, I've been there so many times I'm probably more likely to know the right thing to do, whereas playing a, I played a different deck lately in uh, a league that's going on. I made a silly mistake in game three because that was my first league with the deck. Well, if you're an archetype specialist like we are, then you're going to be more likely to know what to do there and not make those mistakes. All right, but if that counts as being too popular, if that still crosses the threshold, then... There's a few players that I actually don't know if they still play competitively. Uh, there's a guy, TJ Poole, I think he still does. I'm pretty sure he still plays competitively. He's pretty good. 
he's also one of those players that kind of sticks with the same few archetypes and or the same the same game plan and because he does that he's pretty good I, I wonder if I how long has been since I've seen that TJ guy oh uh, <laughs> a few others going out there that I don't actually know still play as as much uh, let's see so like Devin Cox and Paul Sauter from Athens. There, there's an Athens crew that, that sort of created this culture of like mutually feeding, not feeding, building ourselves up competitively. And a lot of the reason that I'm as okay as I am is <laughs> because of players like them. Uh, Evan, forgot your last name, I'm sorry. Uh, Chris Wall, I believe is his last name. Both of those are exceedingly good players. But I don't know for a fact that they still play competitively. So it's hard for me to answer that for sure regarding them. But those are also very, very, very good players <laughs> that are still pretty unknown. Regional players, if we're lowering the threshold down to there, super good in the region. I'm saying this like, well, like we're a fighting game scene or something. Super good in the region, not terribly known outside of the region. Okay. Um, and then the next question, how is your play style adapted from watching pro players? I can answer that question in the following two words, Tom Ross. <laughs> Uh, religiously watching Tom Ross will will make you a better, not just infect player, but like, he and it's not even aggro. He has his own way of doing aggro, where the object is to kind of overwhelm you with spells. Uh, not not that he's necessarily. Uh, I don't I don't know how to how to explain it. But a lot of his decks are. I'm gonna very quickly drown you in cheap, uh, efficient spells early in the game. And you're not going to have much that you can do about it. It's sort of a theme. He, it's his play style. Think of Infect. Think of Boss Sly. Think of when he played Heroics and Standard. Think even when he plays Eight Rack. That's that's kind of what he does. Uh, and so, watching that, and, and also I, I guess something something to note. I generally dislike poker. I, I I can respect people who play it competitively because I know that there's more than just luck going on. But it's not my cup of tea. But, if you play a deck like Infect, it behooves you to be able to get reads on your opponent as to, for example, whether or not you can go off then. Sometimes you'll have to, that's not the kind of decision I mean. I mean, is it safe to try to go off here? We don't have Gitaxian Probe anymore in any format, save my favorite format, but we don't have Gitaxian Probe anymore. And so, you're either going to have to play something kind of bad like Peak. Or you just have to try to figure it out. And Tom Ross is good at poker. He's he was a player, he was a dealer, and he had to develop that skill, and it behooved him <laughs> quite a bit. I think, without knowing it, that sort of rubbed off onto me a bit because I started trying to pick out uh, tells from my opponent. If you if you play a deck like Infect, let me let me spoil something here for you. Watch your opponent. Oftentimes they will give off tells without knowing it. Um, so there you go. That that is. Uh, get into more detail on that. I have. It is something that I cover in my patron exclusive infect guide that is not published yet, but is already over 120 pages long because I keep adding new stuff to it. So if you want to read that when it gets published, <laughs> then become a patron. It also gets questions in here for you. Uh, and then the the last one is. Do you agree or disagree with stores opening for tournaments soon? Okay, so today is April 25th. Point of reference for just to timestamp this a little bit. I'm, I'm talking about this on April 25th. No! <laughs> I'm sorry if I spiked your audio there. Sorry, rip headphone users. No, 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 no. Please, no. It is hard on store owners, unfortunately. Right now, they're not really able to... To, to have the same revenue sources. You can still, if you're a store like Tapstart, for instance, you can still send cards out. They have their own store online. They sell through, I believe, TCG Player as well. So they can still make money, but they don't get uh, tournament entries, entry fees. They don't get people buying packs or singles in the store, snack purchases, in the case of Tapstart, things like board games and video games and collectible bobblehead, whatever those things are called, pop-up, whatever, <laughs> those things, <laughs> there's everywhere, or, um, or sleeves, or 
deck boxes or bigger deck boxes or <laughs> and so on. You, you, they don't have those kinds of revenue sources anymore and that hurts when this store has to stay closed for so long. I'm glad they have something they can do, um, but it's not safe yet. It's, I'm sorry, it's just not uh, to be that close to everybody else. Even if you're wearing masks and gloves, no, please, please wait. Absolutely, please, please wait. Uh, I, I would love to run tournaments for Tapstar that are happening on Discord video where you send the money through PayPal or something like that. But, but please, don't actually go into the store. Actually, that sounds like a good idea. That's, let's do that, right? <laughs> uh, but no, please, for the love of all things good and holy, no! Do not stay, stay home. Not do not stay home. Stay home. Do not go into gatherings like that. Okay, that's that's my take on that. We will get the chance to. Um, where I live, there is not anywhere near enough testing. At the time I'm saying this, about a little bit more than one percent of the population has been tested. Because there's so little testing, we really can't afford, and because there are so many people who already have it, we can't afford to go back out yet. We can't, um, you know, it's not like in a place like South Korea where you can see if that a person has it through testing, quarantine them, and then do contact tracing to find the people that they were in touch with and quarantine them and so forth to help keep it under control. We don't have enough testing and it's already gotten out of control anyway, so we're we're past the point where we can do that without a massive investment that we're not making. I don't want to get political, but for right now, it basically the short of it is that we can't safely. Um, I, I would not, as as much as I love Tapstar, I would not like for it to become a hotbed for for the vi the thing that'll get this video demonetized. <laughs> I wonder if saying demonetized makes it happen to you. I wonder. I'll, I'll have an answer for you for that in just a bit, maybe even in the description or the comments. Maybe. I'll, I'll find out pretty soon. <laughs> All right. There will be another shot at this. If you have any more questions, uh, then be a patron and put them in our AMA chat on the Discord. Because once you're a patron, you get access to not just the Discord, you get access to the Discord anyway, but to the patron-only sections of it, uh, where you can submit questions like this. Or be good friends with someone who is a patron so you can get questions in that way because loopholes. <laughs> all right. Take care, Magic Community. I will see you all later. Bye-bye.